all of that. But what if we really get to experience Christmas? So I want to share with you some biblical truths about Christmas and hoping by the end of this service that you and I would have a great understanding and deeper uh, experience, appreciation for Christmas, okay? So in the book of Matthew chapter 1 is this. The book of Matthew chapter 1. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was blessed to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now look at me for a second. This prophecy, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us comes from the book of Isaiah. So God gave a prophecy, gave a promise to Isaiah at the time uh, of King Ahaz. Now, here's a very interesting uh, thought. This Isaiah 714 is pretty popular. I mean, you, there, you, you open up a Christmas card, right? And you would see, Isaiah 714, and it would say, you know, uh, it says the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. But would you not agree with me that this is more than just what we see on Christmas cards? Yes. Amen. I mean, Isaiah 714 is so amazing. It's just so remarkable. The fact that this declaration, this promise, means so much to us. It is a declaration of the promise of Christmas. When the prophet Isaiah gave the prophetic word of Christmas, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. King Ahaz was the king at the time. Now, King Ahaz, you got to know his story. He's a bad king, really a bad king. And the Bible tells us that he was a man of idolatry. He loves to serve false gods. Uh, he was so disobedient to God. He was rebellious. One of the things that he would do, he would sacrifice his own children to a fire for a known false god. Uh, he introduced these many gods, specifically the Syrian gods, into Jerusalem. I mean, God specifically said... In the, in the Ten Commandments, right, that he gave to Moses, do not what? Make for yourself an idol, right? Or serve this idol. But then King Ahaz didn't care. He introduced still these Syrian gods into Jerusalem. He was the king. And then he, he, look at this. When his enemies were attacking him, instead of going to God for help, he went to these false gods. Now, this is really bad. <laughs> really bad. <laughs> So when he died at the age of 36 years old, pretty young when he died, do you know that they refused, refused, the people of Israel refused to bury him with the other kings? I don't know about you, but that tells me, man, this, his legacy was just bad, bad, that the people of, his own people would refuse a burial next to the other kings. And so, uh, here's the thing to think about. But in the midst of, of King Ahaz's rebellion and disobedience and the life that he lived outside of God's will, now look at me, God still gave the promise of Christmas. In the midst of all of that, God showed up and told Isaiah, the virgin, a virgin will give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. 
that in the midst of his rebellion, in the midst of his disobedience to God, God still gave a promise of Christmas. I don't know about you, but that's exciting. The announcements of Christmas was given, and so therefore this shows us this, this, this thing, this remarkable act of God's love. This, this promise of Christmas shows us the remarkable act of God's love. In a remarkable act of love, in the midst of his disobedience, in the midst of his rebellion, God gave a promise, the promise of Christmas to King Ahaz. Are you with me? Now, look at me. Fast forward 700 years. Fast forward 700 years later. The people of Israel were in great distress under the power of Rome. And guess what? Christmas came anyway. So now... Let me back up. So I want to make sure you're with me, okay? So 700 years prior to the coming of Christ, in the midst of the rebellion and disobedience of King Ahaz and the people of Israel, the promise of Christmas was given. You follow me? 700 years later, fast forward, In the midst of their rebellion, still, and they live in a very chaotic, just bad, you know, place under the power of Rome, Christmas came anyway. Christmas was given. Christmas came anyway. And here's the thing, friends. Um... What amazes me about the story of Christmas is this, is that when the promise of Christmas was announced, the king and the people of Israel were not in good standing with God. When Christmas came, the people were not in good standing with God as well. But the promise of Christmas was given and Christmas came anyway in the midst of all of that. And I don't know about you, but that tells me about this remarkable act of God's love. Would you not agree? This is a story of how much we don't deserve to be rescued by this holy God. But he chose to come anyway. He chose to come for you. He chose to come for me. I don't know about you, but this is exciting. Would you not agree? Oh, come on now. Should I just talk to the haze? Maybe they would respond better. Come on now, you you can respond better. Because this is really the remarkable act of God's love for you and me. Um, maybe you're struggling today with your obedience to God. Maybe your life is not fully surrendered to Him. Maybe your life is not fully, fully devoted in following Jesus. Maybe you're following Him half-heartedly, and maybe not at all. Uh, maybe you feel so distant from God because of what you've done in the past or maybe what, because of what you're doing. I want you to know that Jesus came for that. Jesus came for your rebellion. Jesus came for my rebellion. Jesus came for your sins and mine. Jesus came for your disobedience and mine. That's why Christmas came for that. And... Uh, He came so that he could forgive our sins. He came to take your place because you and I can pay the price of our sins. We deserve hell. (laughs) We do. But because of his remarkable act of love, he came to take your place and mine. I don't know about you, man. That just excites me. If I can just show your excitement, I will just throw things just out of excitement. And uh, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. But I'm just really excited about talking about Christmas. Because Christmas, a lot of times we understand Christmas so just in the surface. It's not deep. And my hope today is that by the end of the service that you would understand Christmas deeper. Jesus said, 
that I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is my favorite passage is because Jesus came anyway in spite of my rebellion, in spite of my disobedience to him. He came for me. The fact that he would say, I have come to give you my life. Really? You would do that? Yes. And not only that I, I, want, I want you to have my life, but I want you to have it in abundance. My goodness. He came for that? I want to tell you. He came for that? Yes. He came for that. In John 3.16, you all know this passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave. That's a remarkable act of his love that in, in the midst of our rebellion and our, and our disobedience, the father would, would say, son, go. Go. And save them from death. And so not only... The promise of Christmas was given, but also Christmas came for you and me. Oh. Um, the second thing that I basically is pretty obvious here, not only his remarkable act of love, but also that love chases us. Now think about that for a moment. Love chases you and me. What? His love would chase you and me. Now, now think about this. Into the ugliness of the king's rebellion. Because we know that there's, there was nothing we know of Ahaz's life, the king, king's life, that really deserved the pursuit of God. Right? But love chased him in a way. The people of Israel were so rebellious and so <laughs> disobedient. And there was absolutely nothing that they deserve the pursuit of God, but love chased them anyway. <laughs> I mean, come on, look at, look at you, look at me. I mean, do, do you really think that we deserve anything from God? Come on. No, but his love chases us anyway. That's the good news, right? That's why, you're, now thank you, Brother Gail, I got one, oh, two, oh, come on, just, we're getting there. We're alive, come on, give him praise. Oh, yes, thank you. You know what they told me? Is that second service is tough. It's a tough crowd, but you gotta, you gotta correct them. It's not a tough crowd. Are you a tough crowd? No. Thank you. Wow. So, we're gonna see if, if, if what they're saying is true. <laughs> uh, Emmanuel, God with us, is really not a promise of, uh, is not a promise born of human goodness. Amen. There's nothing good about you and me. The Bible tells us very clear that no one is righteous, not even one. That every single one of us have fall short of the glory of God, right? So, Emmanuel, God with us, is not a promise born of human goodness. But instead, it is born out of God's love. Period. That's it. It's born uh, out of God's love. What God is saying is this, is that I am coming into the mess to live with you, and I'm willing to do that. Can you just imagine that for a moment? I mean, my life was a mess that he was willing to come into my mess. Oh, my goodness. And the fact that he's willing to come into your mess, come on now. That is the fact that, I mean, just the understanding of his, the remarkable act of his love and that love chases us. It's just so amazing, the fact that his love chases us. Um, I don't think we'll ever come to understand why he loves you and me. I don't know. I look at myself. I mean, you love me that much, God? What did you see in me? And you're probably asking a question. But some of you that are, you think you're all good. Oh, yeah, God, God, he's got a great guy, <laughs> a good guy, a good man, a good woman, right? So I've asked a couple of people uh, to be ready at the end of the service to kind of slap you upside down if you're one of those people. And just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> you know, uh, but nobody's good. Nobody. 
Maybe you're here today and you just don't understand what God would want you, would love you in spite of. Um, why would he pursue you? Why would he love you? I, I really don't have an answer for you, but the truth of the matter is, he does. Yes. 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 He does. And so this idea of, well, the truth of the matter is that God loves me, I don't understand it. Well, how do we believe that? It's simply by faith. Yes. By faith... I know that his remarkable act of love and that his love chases me, that I am his, the most valuable treasure, the fact that, man, his love is so deep, it's so wide, so great. How do I know that? It's simply by faith. That's it. By faith. And I'm experiencing how great and how wide and how deep is his love simply because of that. I believe it, and I'm experiencing it today. And he wants you to experience that. Yes. How wide and how deep, how great is his love for you. And um, maybe you're here today, and you're questioning your value. But the truth of the matter is that you are God's greatest miracle. You are. You are God's greatest miracle. And uh, I struggled with, with this value. I really did. And, uh, and thank God that I understood the power of Jesus to set me free from this. Um, there was one time I was praying, and I felt like the Holy Spirit just told me, Son, what is the greatest miracle what is the greatest miracle? And so immediately I began to scan the Bible of all of the many miracles that he did that was uh, recorded in the Bible. And so the first thing that came up, I was like, oh man, the, uh, where, you know, the Red Sea, when you parted the Red Sea, that, that's got to be the, the amazing, best miracle of all, the greatest miracle of all, right? And I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, no, son, that's not it. What? Okay. Because, and God said to me, because the water came back to its place. And then so I began to scan some more, and I said, God, oh, oh I got one. God, what about when you fed the 5,000 and the 4,000? I mean, that's got to be the greatest miracle of all, right? Because come on. I mean, how in the world can you feed 5,000 and 4,000 with just a few loaves and few fish? That's got to be it, Right? And I feel like the Holy Spirit told me, no, son, you're wrong again. Because the following day, they were looking for me, and they want some more. Yeah. They were hungry again. So that's not, a, that's not it either. And so, so I began to scan some more. I'm like, man, okay, God, I got one. This has got to be good. This has got to be good. The best and greatest miracle of all is this, is that when Lazarus died, right, and a few days later, you stood up and commanded Lazarus to come out, and he was alive. He was dead for a couple of days. Now he's alive. That's got to be the greatest miracle of all, right? And he said, no, son, that's not it either. Because I want you to know that Lazarus died again. And so I was like, okay, God, I, I'm, I don't have anything else. What is the greatest miracle? And I felt like the Holy Spirit told me, look in the mirror. And I was like, are you kidding me? I am the greatest miracle? And then the Holy Spirit told me, yes, son, because what I've done in your life, the miracle that took place in your life is for all eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So you might say, man, pastor, but you don't understand my past. You don't understand my life. Well, I don't know. I, I said this earlier. I'm going to challenge you uh, to tell me your story, and I'll tell you my story and see who wins. But does it matter? No. No. Somebody can come up here and tell me your story. I mean, I'll try to beat you because I got a really pretty bad story in regards to my past. 
But then, if God tells me that I am his greatest miracle, and I'm telling you today that you are his greatest miracle, how do you receive that? Just by faith. My past is just a, just a chapter. Just a chapter of my life. When my mother had abandoned me, that was just a chapter. When my dad left me when I was six, that was just another chapter. When, when I was abused physically, that was just a chapter. When I was sexually abused three different times when I was a teenager, that was just a chapter. When I began to do cocaine and crack, that was just a chapter. When I was selling drugs, that was just a chapter. And then something so deep that I tried to kill myself, guess what? That was just another chapter. And then during that time, something so amazing took place in my life. That in the midst of, of me just trying to prepare to kill myself, Jesus came. Jesus came. And he began to work in my life. He began to write new chapters. Incredible story of love and peace and joy and just his life in abundance. I'm telling you today, I'm so excited about my story. Yeah, I've had some bad ones, really bad ones. But guess what? Man, today, I'm enjoying my life simply because of the life of Jesus Christ that lives in me. And I tell you all of that, it's to simply say this, that don't ever believe the lies of the devil. That just because people have devalued you does not mean you've lost your value. You're valuable, not according to their eyes, not according to my eyes. You're valuable simply because God declared you to be valuable. And you're so valuable that out of our rebellion, out of our disobedience, Christmas was given. The promise was given. 700 years later, after the promise was given, Christmas came anyway. And today, we have an opportunity to experience Christmas like never before. And that's why this is one of my favorite messages that I've preached for all these 17 years. It's just a reminder that not only that I can celebrate Christmas, but I can, get, I, 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 I can experience it deeper. And so friends, I just want to encourage you today. Don't let go of this message. This message is not only for Christmas. This is for a lifetime. That he loves you so much. You are his, the, the, the greatest miracle. His most treasure. That's how much he loves you. That's just the truth. And so let me just encourage you today. Experience Christmas. Experience Christmas. Experience the love of Jesus experience it. How many of you received this message today? Would you bow your heads?